Genesis, Genesis chapter number 3. And um, again, it's a pleasure to be able to be here and enjoy, uh, enjoy the company of your pastor and his family, as well as the uh, people we've been able to meet over the past day or so. And um, today, um, me and my wife, so me and my wife, we've been married for five years come October. So this is our five-year anniversary, and it's kind of neat because, um, because, you know, every... You, People celebrate anniversaries, right, like, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, you know. Uh, some people like to do it off years, like we'll do it the year 4, then year 12, or whatever the case may be. But um, it worked out uh, when brothers, when Pastor Jones uh, scheduled us back, I think it was like two years ago, uh, that, that we were able to be out here right around that time, and we are able to celebrate and uh, see, uh, just spend some time together, as well as be able to experience the creation that God has allowed us to live in. And so today we got to go do a little excursion out to Seven Falls, and it was a, it was fun to be able to see some waterfalls and climb some stairs. And <laughs> It's a lie. That is a lie. The stairs were, were, uh, were not very fun. But um, anyway, uh, so we, we, enjoyed, uh, we enjoyed being here. But, you know, it's crazy to think about that... Uh, as beautiful as Colorado is, it's not as great as God created the earth whenever he created it in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and obviously we know that through the Genesis chapter 3 and through the, the curse of the flood that the, the earth has changed. But um, tonight I want to spend a couple minutes in Genesis chapter 3. And this is a very familiar passage of scripture as it is, uh, it is the fall of man. And uh, this is, if you're going to get anybody saved, people have to understand that, that sin came in because one man disobeyed God. Yeah. And, um, and so as we come through tonight, tonight might be more, uh, it might be more foundational, but I believe as the older we get and the more complex as Christianity becomes, we tend to forget the foundation and we, it, it, the, what used to be big and, and the, the idea of sin that caused us to come to that rock of stumbling, that rock of fence, Jesus Christ, uh, we, we then somehow begin to justify it or explain it away. And, um, and tonight my goal here is to bring us to the idea that uh, when sin came, so did a lot of baggage that came with it. And so I want to preach to you a message tonight called the baggage of sin. The baggage of sin. And so we're going to, I'd ask you to stand real quick as we will. And uh, let's just read, um, we'll read, we'll start verse number, verse number one. We'll read the first six verses. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall, eat, uh, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the fr trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of it the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. We'll stop the reading there, and ask the Lord just to bless this time. Lord, thank you for the time you've given us, and Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of your people to the house of God. And God, I ask that uh, every one of us here would, would remember that the reason the world is the way it is, is because of this little issue of sin. And God, I ask that you would help us to do our best to uh, not associate ourselves with sin, Lord, but to associate with righteousness, so that sin won't have to affect us like it did in the beginning, Lord, but we'll be able to have that victory over it as you allowed us through the, through the Son and what He did on the cross of Calvary. And God, thank you for what you're going to do. In your name I ask. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I remember when I was a kid and, uh, and I had... Um, and I'd go to someone's house or to my friend's house. You know, I had my little backpack for school or something. I'd dump all my school stuff out of it. Being a homeschooler, you know, my, you don't you don't really go to school. But uh, but uh, I had mom would make sure we had our own little backpacks and we had to keep all of our books and stuff in our backpacks because we had to look like we're in real school, right? And uh, and 
And I remember if I was going to a friend's house, I would dump all my school stuff out and I'd dump it on the ground and I'd throw all my clothes into my backpack and I'd take it over there and it'd actually do some usefulness, right? I'd actually take it out of the house. Well, um, as years have gone, I've realized that if I'm going to stay overnight somewhere, it's not as simple as grab a backpack anymore. The older I get, the more I realize that I got my backpack, and then I've got, uh, then I've got my toiletry bag, and then I've got my pillow, and then I've got my blanket, and then I've got more and more stuff. And and I'm realizing uh, every time I load up for vacation uh, or any time that we not going somewhere away from the house, uh, my suitcases just get bigger and bigger, right? And such is life, right? The, old, the older you get, the more you're, you're, you expand, the more that is needed. Can I tell you, friend, when, when sin came into the world, sin didn't come in and, and it, it wasn't like some non-existent thing. But when sin came, it brought a lot of baggage with it immediately. And my goal here tonight, and as I said, it's more, it's more informational than anything. And as, as we just recovered this foundational chapter... But, um, but I want us to understand that when we are living in sin, there is some baggage that does come with it. As long as, you, as, long as there is sin in your life, and, and, and obviously none of us are perfect, we're all going to struggle with sin, so, so that's across the board. And, and, but if sin is ruling our life, and if sin is, has attached itself to the point where it becomes a stronghold in our life, and it's not a constantly as God brings it to our attention and we confess it, but we let it sit and we let it just fester into our lives, there's a lot of baggage, there's a lot of weight that comes into it, and it causes us not to be able to run the race that God wants us to, as Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12, and that we ought to cut those things loose so that we can be light, but instead it causes us to be slow, and it doesn't allow us to go where God wants us to go. And so, as we get into this, I want you to I want to bring some baggage to mind that sin does. The first one happens in verse number 7. Now, obviously, uh, we know that, that Satan lied to Eve and, and convinced her that, that obeying, uh, that, um, that eating the, the fruit would... would uh, Calls her to be as wise as God is. But in verse number 7, we see, first off, that after she ate, and after Adam ate with her, and that's an important note, by the way, Adam ate with her. So, Adam was there along with her, even though it was technically Eve that made the first bite. Adam didn't stop her in the process. Anyway, that's, a, that's another message for another time. But in verse number 7, it says, And the eyes of them both were opened. I want you to see... I want you to see first off that sin brought knowledge of right and wrong. You realize that um, the, the, the struggle of good and evil has always been in our culture and our society. And it's been that way ever since Eve ate, uh, Adam and Eve ate and disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Up until then, God had no desire for Adam and Eve to struggle with right and wrong. He had no desire. That's why when God made Adam and Eve as it is, He made them in the image of God. He made them perfect. Just like, just like God made everything in creation good. And He called it good because there was no errancy in it when He created it. And so when God made man and God called them, they were made in the image of God. They, they, were, they were immortal at that time. And they, were, and they were perfect at that time because there was no sin. And, and it's hard for us to imagine this because I, there's never been a time since the beginning of time that sin has been in the world. It, it's hard for us to imagine a world without sin and a world without wickedness and a world without bad because none of us have ever seen it. And, and, and when, in this case, Adam and Eve were literally created in a perfect universe where there was no wrong. It was a perfect utopia, much like every socialist wants. Right? But in this case, when God created it, it was perfect. And when He made them, He gave them one rule. The one rule was this, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, somewhere along the line, Adam stressed, because God told Adam this, and Adam communicated to Eve. Somewhere along the line, Eve got, maybe Adam stressed and maybe put some extra boundary there, saying, you don't even need to touch that thing or we're going to die because God said it. And so, somewhere along the line, it got miscommunicated. So when Eve went there to eat, and she touched it, and she realized that she wasn't going to die, and then she, oh, I guess I can eat it too and she went to go ahead and eat it and as she did it then the battle between right and wrong began and can I tell you friend that the that God wants us to have knowledge in the sense because when God created Adam he gave him the job of naming every creature 
and naming everything. So Adam wasn't some, some hillbilly that didn't know anything. God gave him wisdom to be able to name everything that we see today. Okay, so, so, so Adam did, so God's not against knowledge, but God was against knowledge of knowing right and wrong from the beginning of time. Because God told him, he said, Adam, don't do it. Okay, and so in this case, we know that, uh, we know that this, this struggle of right and wrong has started from the, from the beginning in the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. And and when we look at when we look at again the world that we live in, uh, it's it's you you we make fun of the the girls that get up there at the at like the the Miss America pageants. They're like, well, what what is it that you really want? And they all say this: we want world peace, right? Now that, and everybody makes fun of it, right? Because they're not going to accomplish it, all right? In their little beauty pageants. But, uh, but as the world is looking for world peace, and as they're trying to find it, it's not going to happen. They're, the only time world peace is going to happen is whenever Jesus Christ comes back as the Messiah, and, and not as the Son of God who's going to die on the cross, but when He comes as the risen Savior, as the General of God's army, when He comes and as He then ushers in the millennial reign of Christ, we will have a perfect society at that point in time. But until then, it's not going to happen. And can I tell us that, that as, as we struggle with this idea of right and wrong, and as we get frustrated with a society that struggles with right and wrong, can I tell you, it all boiled down to one woman and one man's choice to eat and disobey where God said not to. One little word called sin. So we know that sin brought the knowledge of right and wrong of moral issues. And so secondly, as we see and, and as we just walk through here, in verse number 7, it says, And they knew that they were naked. So what did they do? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Friend, can I tell you that sin didn't just bring the knowledge of right and wrong. It also brought coverings. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the issues... Uh, one of the issues in today's society is, is the idea that I can dress the way that I want and God doesn't care. But what was the first thing that Adam and Eve realized when they disobeyed God? They realized they were naked. And what's the first thing they did when they saw they were naked? They covered themselves up. Friend, can I tell you that, that, that coverings, the idea of what you wear in clothes, and I'm not preaching standards, I'm not preaching, I'm not preaching that, and I don't want you to think I'm preaching that, but the idea that God cares about what we appear in and what we dress in is literally in the first chapters of the Bible. And, and, and as Adam and Eve, as they saw it, they realized that they need to cover themselves because they then realized that they were naked and that there was sin in the world and that it was no longer about pleasing God. It was now about pleasing self. And as, then, as this battle then came into it, they realized that there's some things that were right and there's some things that were wrong and they automatically associated nakedness as wrong. Now, friend, can I tell you, one of, the, one of the struggles in Christianity today is this idea of liberty. And, and this idea of Christian liberty. Do we have Christian liberty? Absolutely. But that liberty should not be used to sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, as Paul wrote, he says, Shall we continue in sin? And Paul said, God forbid! We should not just continue in sin because we're putting what Christ did on the cross, we're making it annulled. We're literally making it nothing as we just continue to walk on that mat of grace and say, well, God will just forgive me every time. Friend, that is not repentance. If you get on your knees and you know there's something wrong in your life and there's sin in your life and you say, well, God, would you forgive me? And you're going to walk out that door and you know you're going to do it again and again. And you're just going to say, God, forgive me every time, knowing that there's not ever a really repentance in your mind or in your heart. There's no, that's not repentance. That's not forgiveness. That's just, that's just what a Catholic does every time they walk into Mass, every, every time they have confession. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Can I tell you, friend, when, when it comes to this, sin brought this idea of coverings. And, and, when, and we, we must remember, again, before sin happened, there was no flesh. 
There was no flesh, there was no flesh side of us that, that had to adapt to sin. But rather, we wanted to serve God. We were bent to serve God because God created us that way. And so we see that sin brings coverings. And there's, there's another biblical application that we'll bring up later. But can I tell you, sin brought knowledge right and wrong. It brought coverings in the idea that we need to cover ourselves. But can I tell you, friend, it also, call, it also brought fear. Look down at verse number 8. So as they cover themselves, they make, them, they make themselves and sew themselves aprons, and they make them, and in verse number 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, when we say sin brought fear, this is not the, this is not the fear that, that Solomon's trying to pass down to his son of reverencing God and, and having that respect for God. This fear is the fear of being found out. Yeah. Can I tell you, friend, when, 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 when sin brought fear and fear came with it, it was because they realized right and wrong. And as they realized they had chosen wrong, they did not want to stand in front of the face and face God in their shame. And, and as this fear came in, what is the result that they did? They went and hid themselves when they would have rather, when they would have typically came in fellowship with God and walked and talked with God in the garden. As God called and said, Adam, where art thou? They're hiding because they know they're in sin. And can I tell you, friend, when, when, when sin is in your life, it is always accompanied by fear. Fear of being found out. Oh, what's, what's my husband going to think? What's, what's, what's my wife going to say when she finds this out? What's my dad going to say? What's, what's my parents? What's my pastor going to say? The, li the list is endless and endless. Because as we know, uh, as the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. As we know when we have sinned and we've stepped out of the way of God and we find ourselves living in sin in that time, we don't want to go have meetings with a pastor because we know that somewhere along the line, preacher's going to say, hey, what's going on with you? And then you have the choice to be honest with him and say, this is what's going on. Or you can lie to his face and say, nothing's happening, Pastor. And just continuing in your sin. Sin brings fear. And, and, a, and a Christian that is in sin does not want to come to the house of God. A Christian that is in sin does not want to read the Word of God because it's going to convict him. A, a, a Christian that is in sin doesn't want to fellowship with Christians who are, who are godly and are living a Christ-like life. Why? Because you're afraid of being found out. The Bible tells us in, in, um, in Philippians chapter 4, when, when Paul was writing to the church of Philippi, he said, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I was reading a book this summer for, uh, in preparation for our camp ministry. And more, Lord willing, I'll tell you about that in the uh, next coming days. But um, as, as we were getting our staff ready, we were reading this book, and there's a chapter on... Peace, on the peace of God. And the author made the idea of the peace of God is God's referee for our life. So much like you have a football game when uh, you have a referee that has a whistle, when they blow, the, when they blow it, that means the time's going to stop or somebody stepped out of bounds or somebody scored. You know, that you listen for the whistle and that's what the game literally revolves around in the order aspect. And so in, in the Christian life, the order that God gives is the peace of God. And when the and when the when there is lack of peace, we know that there is something wrong in our life. You know, it's it's very possible to be in stressful situations and still have God's peace on your life. Think of it this way. Daniel was a, was a prophet. He was a man that, that, that literally followed God. And as he obeyed God, he opened up his window. He knelt down. He prayed to God. As he prayed to him, he was thrown into a den of lions. But he wasn't thrown in kicking and screaming, I'm innocent! You're a bunch of heathens! You're a bunch of pagans! Let me go! No, he didn't say that. He literally went down there, and what happened? God, God sent an angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They didn't touch him. They didn't harm him. And Daniel was at peace in a, in a den filled with hungry, starving lions. 
And, and so you say, well, there's, there's certain situations where I can't have peace. No, you can have peace in every situation, but as long as sin is present in your life, whether it's an attitude of sin, whether it's a thought of sin, whether it's an action of sin that is happening, as long as it's present, fear will be there, and peace cannot content, peace cannot be in, in, in unity with fear, but they are contrary. It's the, they're two sides of a coin. Either you're in peace or you're in fear. And if your life is characterized by fear in this moment, maybe there's some sin that needs to get out. So sin brings fear. But not just that, friend. Sin brings conflict. Look down at verse number 11. And he said, Who has told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest eat, not eat? And the man said... The woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And so, so, so as you look at these verses, there's conflict that happens here. Now, you must realize, before this time, there was no conflict that we know of. When God created everything, it was good. It was perfect. There was no sin. There was no flesh. And, and when we have conflict in our life, it's because there's a, there's a battle between selfishness and selflessness. And, and when, it, when it came down to it, when Adam and Eve sinned, and sin came into the world, it brought the first conflict. And the conflict was between God and His creation. You see, when, when God created, again, as God created man, it was perfect, there was unity, there was fellowship. But as sin came in the world, that fellowship was broke. And now God and man were at odds with, it, with each other because everything that God stood for, sin is against. And everything that sin stands for is against the, the, the scriptures, and is against the principles of God. And as we look at this and consider this, God comes to Adam and he confronts him. He says, did you eat? Of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. It brought conflict between God and man. And God had to have that rough conversation with Adam. And he had to have that rough. The, the, the idea of having to judge his creation. All because of one disobedience. Of eating something they shouldn't have. And as it comes down. God was at conflict with his creation. But not just that. It caused conflict between Adam and his wife. You realize that before... Before Eve and Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, there was no marital arguments. It was peace. They enjoyed their life without having to fight about where they're going to eat and about having to fight about what, what they're going to do. But, but in the, in who was right and, who, and, and instead of having to say yes ma'am, uh, like most of the time the husbands have to say yes ma'am because the wife is normally right. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I say that because my wife's in the room. Um, I'm just kidding. She's not like that. But, uh, but, but uh, because when, when we look at marriage nowadays, it's constantly wives and husbands butting heads and, and constantly having conflict in the home and, and, and in different situations. But before sin, that wasn't there. And, and I realize, and in my life, when, when I am in sin, and I find myself not dwelling on the Scriptures and not yielding to the Spirit, the relationship with me and my wife is not always the best. And especially when you compound that with we're living and seeing each other 24-7, living in a 300 square foot RV, and there, I don't have a separate office or anything, and when you compound that along with the sin, then it makes it even worse. I think Solomon said something along like this. It's better to dwell in the corner of a house, to, uh, corner of a rooftop, than in the house with an angry woman. All right. <laughs> but it, but all that, all these things that we deal with in, in this conflict area, it all came because of sin. All because of sin, friend. And sin is the source of conflict in our lives. When you when you look at failed marriages, it's because of sin. When you look at dysfunctional families, it's because of sin. When you look at dysfunctional churches, it's because of sin. When you look at dysfunctional relationships, it's because of sin. And it's always because of sin. Yeah. I want you to see, as we jump down in here, as, as God brings out this, this conflict as it comes, then sin brings judgment. In verse number 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of my life. 
of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So you see, the, the first judgment that God, that God brought was judgment on the serpent. And by the way, I hate snakes. Any person that likes snakes, I think that you might need to get saved again. Uh, I'm just... I, I, there, there's... I, there's there's some the serpent is cursed for a reason. I'm just going to leave it at that. But anyway, um, as as the serpent, uh, God judged the serpent. That's the reason ser- uh, snakes are hated, and 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 because of that. But it was it was. He said, "I will put enmity between thee and thy seed, and between the woman and her seed." And so uh, there's a reason that we hate snakes, and it's because the curse. All right. So God judged the serpent because of because of what uh, he. Tempted the woman with. And in verse number 15, uh, sorry, 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The judgment on the woman was this sorrow and childbirth. So, ladies, you can blame, your, you can blame Adam and Eve. And just leave it at that. Okay? And then, submission to the husband. You realize, at Creation. When God made Adam and Eve, even though Adam was the head of the household, they were we worked together. They were they were equals in a sense. They worked together. They they because there was no sin, there was no conflict, there was no constant rise of pride trying to overdo things. But because of all this, God had to establish order in the family. He established the husband as the head, and he established the wife in submission to the husband. And that's how God created it. Now society looks at it differently. Society's trying to rewrite the way the family works. They're trying to say, "Well, Dad, you ought to stay at home and be the stay at home, uh, be the stay at home dad, and Mom, you ought to be out there working." That's not biblical, by the way. The Bible clearly states that the man was supposed to provide for his family by the sweat of his brow. He was to work and to take care of his family while the while his wife would there and then as they bore, bear children would raise the children. The husband was the provider. The wife was submissive to the husband. Was the helpmate to the husband. And as they ruled the family together, they would bring the family up in unity and love. Yeah. But you look at the family unit today in America. And it's so contrary to that. Yeah. You, one in, in our camp ministry that we run, it, it's a it's a free, it's a tuition free camp, and uh, the Lord the Lord takes care of it every year. We can tell you more about it, but uh, because it's free and because it's it's more of a mission outreach camp, uh, we get a lot of kids in there that they don't have daddies or they don't have mamas or they, there's a lot of estranged situations, and and it will break your heart to talk to some of these kids as they come in and they're like, well, uh, my my parents they they drop me off here because they don't want me around. And it just breaks your heart because it's just like, how can someone treat their little third grade boy or third grade girl that is just wants to be loved? How can they treat them like they're just a dog on the street? But that's how society has made the families like, well, they're just, they're just add-ons to your tax so you can get tax credits. But when God created the family friend, He created it in unity and love. Not in conflict, and not. In, but anyway, as as a source of all this, it brought judgment on the man. Work was now work, but it eventually brought judgment on all mankind. Look down in verse number, ooh, down in verse number twenty-one, and unto and uh, and unto Adam also, and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. You see. God told him at the beginning, if you eat this, you will die. Now, it's not, it's not an immediate death like if you're eating a poison apple and like an old Cinderella story kind of thing. But it's, 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 it's the idea of that death started when they disobeyed God. And as they began to die on that day, God came to them and He saw them. And, and so as, as this judgment came, this judgment of death passed on all men. And it's very interesting. And if you were to, if you were to look in the Genesis story, you would see that... Uh, look, just turn over here and look at this. In Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says in verse number 1. And this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made He him. Male and female created he them. So he, they were, man was made in the likeness of God. And blessed them and called their name Adam in that day when they were created. Verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness 
after his image and called his name Seth. Now, did you pick that up? It's his own likeness and in his image. You say, what is that image? That image was the image of a sinful man. You see, because when God created Adam, he was perfect. He was sinless. There was no corruption. There was no flesh. There was no temptation. There was none of that. But as soon as sin entered the world, then all of a sudden God had to judge man. And they were sinners. And the Bible says that we are born in sin. And, and, and sin was I... Was I Psalm 51, verse number 3. And sin was I conceived. All right? as, 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 as the Bible tells us that uh, because we're sin, uh, we, because we're from the man named Adam and Eve, and as we've gone back to that sinful flesh, we're born in our sin, and we are destined to die in hell unless Jesus Christ comes and takes, takes the difference. And, and so judgment was not God's original plan. God had, no, God had no desire to judge mankind. He had no desire to judge His creation. He had no desire to break fellowship with man. That was all man's doing. That was all sin's doing. Sin brought judgment. But along with that judgment, sin showed us God's love. As we read in verse number 21, God made them coats of skins and clothed them. You see, they made aprons of figs, of plants. They tried to cover it with their own works and with their own ability. And God said, that's not good enough. You are now a sinner. It is in your blood. This is a blood problem. That's why the Bible writes in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so something had to die to take the place of Adam and Eve and had to die for them. And that's why God allowed the sacrificial system to come into play throughout the years of Israelites as, as the one spotless lamb would come and as it would die for the sins of all Israel on the day of atonement, as the high priest would take that blood, he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat on the, in the Holy of Holies and God would forgive Israel of their sin. It was all a picture pointing to when Jesus Christ would walk up to John the Baptist at the Jordan and he would say, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And when God caused Adam and Eve to be clothed in the skins of, I believe it was a, of a lamb, just like he allowed in the, in the sacrificial systems. But as God allowed that to have, take place, it showed us that God's love is sacrificial. God's not just someone that says, I love you, and that's it. God is going to show you His love because love is an action. Uh, there, there's, time, uh, there's times that, that in, in our culture we idea that the idea of love is an emotion. Well, I love you. And uh, we would have kids that would write uh, little, little, little notes at camp to each other. They would, they'd be like, Dear Sally, I saw you when you came to camp on Monday morning and your eyes just made me lost. And I just want you to be my girlfriend. Would you circle yes or no? I love you. Now, that's lust, friend. That's not love. Love is an action. In, in the marriage relationship, I don't always like my wife. But I love choose to love my wife because that's the vow that I made at the altar when I said I will love you as long as we both shall live. Love's an action. And God's love was sacrificial. Because He sent His Son to die for you, for me, and for every man and woman who has ever lived. He died for all of them. But it's not just sacrificial. It's also merciful. And this is very interesting. Look down at verse number 22. And the Lord God said to the Holy Spirit and the Son of God, Behold, the man is become as one of us. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed him at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and flaming swords to turn away to keep the way of the tree of life. Now you say... Did God have to kick him out? He didn't have to. But the reason God kicked Adam and Eve out of Eden was so that they would not have to stay, stay in a sin-cursed state for all eternity. 
You re- it was literally an act of mercy. Because if Adam and Eve, and having now knowing right from wrong, and now having the ability to have some selfishness in them, they could have easily looked and said, "Well, we can get the better of God. We can go to that tree of knowledge of good and evil, or we can go to that tree of life, and we can eat of it, and we can rule with God for all eternity." They could have done that. But God said, in order so so that there is a hope for them, so that you don't have to stay in a sin-cursed state, we're going to remove them from the Garden of Eden. This is an act of mercy. And in a sense, death is an act of mercy. You say, how is that? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Obviously, for the Christian, death is much different than it is for, for a lost person. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 51, the Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So meaning, we shall not all die, but we, there will come a day we will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised up incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So when the dead is raised up, there is no corruption. There is no sin. There is no corruptible. It's incorruption. So when this... So verse number um, 53. For when this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that when you die, or when the rapture comes, when we are changed from this corruptible body, from this fleshly body, into an incorruptible, into, a, into one that is no longer sin-cursed, God will have removed us from the power of sin, from the presence of sin. It will no longer, be, it will have, no longer have any effect over us, and God will then have a perfect creation like He had at creation. Amen. And God did it all just so that we wouldn't have to live all eternity in a sin-cursed state. Now again, this this message was more more informational than than it was in, in something you didn't know. But can I remind you, friend, sin has a lot of baggage that comes with it. But the greatest thing that sin showed us was that God loves you more than anything. God loves you. Why is it then that we struggle with this? Why is it then that we struggle with the arm of the flesh now? It's because we're not yielding to the Spirit of God. We're not living in the Spirit of God. We're living in the power of sin when God has given us the power over sin already. God has given us the victory through Jesus Christ. And because we choose to live in sin, we now have Christians who can't fulfill what their God has called them to do. They can't fulfill the mission that God has called them to do because they're still stuck in their own sin and it's something they put themselves into because God freed them from it when He saved them. And when I got saved, God freed me from the power of sin. And we are dead to sin now. I don't have to say yes to sin anymore. I can say no. And I can go out the exit then through that way of escape that God allows. But as I choose to live in sin, all these things and all this baggage then becomes baggage I have to carry. But the minute I get on my knees and I say, God, would you forgive me for what I did. And would you help me to live in a way that's righteous and help me to say no. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we kneel in repentance and we say, God, would you forgive me? The power of sin no longer has power over us. God has forgiven over us that. And now it is a new day. We have the opportunity to to choose right and wrong again. And God, if we're living in the Spirit of God, if we're yielding to the Spirit, God will give us the power to say yes and not have to go back through the process of going through the muck and the mud of sin and dealing with everything that comes with it. Sin is not the devil's fault. Sin is not somebody else's fault. Sin is... Is your fault. Lord, thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity just to deal with this 
issue that we all that we all struggle with, Lord. There's not a perfect Christian or a perfect person ever lived outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, I ask that you would help us not to have to deal with the baggage that sin brings, but that we could live in the victory that you've given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be victorious Christians. With every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around, no one talking.